resume recording. Okay, excellent. Okay, so um, if you wouldn't mind, uh, go ahead and mute yourself while I'm good, just so we don't have any background noise, and then you're welcome to join in at any time, unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, lots of time for questions uh, while we go through this today. Um, so let me give a quick, uh, there we go, quick coverage of the today's topics. Uh, again, this is the intro to Skyglass live session. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about uh, the basics and onboarding, <clears throat> creating a uh, login. We're going to go over that kind of stuff real quick. Uh, the status page, what happens when you, um, you know, your account uh, expires or the trial ends, etc. Uh, we'll talk about in depth the user interface um, in all ways. Uh, we'll talk about the difference between mill mode and standard mode and how to switch between the two. We'll talk about the uh, favorite locations panel and how to change your home location. We will cover traces in general. Uh, and we'll probably go in pretty deep with traces too. Uh, we'll talk about the type list panel uh, basics there. We'll cover watch lists in uh, general. I did do a deep dive on watch lists uh, just a couple of weeks ago. That's um, That recording is up on YouTube if you want to watch that. I got a thumbs up from Greg. And um, so, and that went into, you know, super deep detail. I think we went a good hour and a half, two hours on that. Uh, we will talk about how to restore your um, default states in Skyglass if you get things a little wonky. And of course, we're going to have time for any Q&A for questions throughout. Um, and we'll pause at the end as well. Uh, today, we're not going to cover uh, the advanced features such as time travel mode, flight history reporting, or the database um, in two days, Friday, we will be doing a deep dive on the database, uh, how to um, do all things with the database and what it is, how it got there, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so be sure to check that out. Um, flight history and time travel is, an al is also another uh, upcoming deep dive um, a few weeks from now. I think those are in June. And uh, just announced, we're doing a special, at the end of June, a special deep dive on uh, how to do what monkey does. So it's a monkey business deep dive, uh, going to be covering the uh, flight history reporting and, and just all the kind of things that he does with Skyglass in his sit reps. Uh, so we can kind of, uh, so y'all can follow along at home. All right. So uh, if um, I'll pause now for any questions, if anybody has any, go ahead and raise your hand or unmute yourself. Okay. Let me take a drink here. All right. So um, first thing I'm going to go a little bit in sort of backwards order. If you have, um, let me move this over. There we go. Okay. If you are using Skyglass and uh, something got wonky and you kind of have, you know, got yourself into a corner, can't really understand how to back yourself out or get things back to normal operation. Um, what you want to do to restore all of the defaults is um, reset the preferences. So what you do in the, in the main button stack here in the bottom right-hand corner, there's a gear wheel um, with a plane at the center. Click on that. That's going to bring up this uh, groovy uh, preferences panel. And what I want you to focus on is on the left-hand side in the center, uh, there's this big full reset button. Uh, big flame. Uh, we click on that. It's going to give you a warning and say, hey, are you sure you want to reset everything? And what this is, will do is basically it, it goes and trashes the preference file that's been maintained uh, through everything that you're doing in Skyglass and then just rewrites it from scratch. It also logs you out. So uh, let's do that first. And you'll see um, a bunch of stuff's going to change. Uh, I'll get logged out and my uh, mode will change and I'll kind of go back to um, basic operation. All right. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So now we're at the login screen. Uh, a couple of things to note um, on the login screen, there are two areas that give sort of feedback. Uh, the one is below the welcome to sky glass. You can see right now it says Skyrider V1.6, which is the version that we're using today, um, which is the latest version as of now. Today is May 17th. <laughs> and then uh, as we do stuff, 
uh, there will be some feedback in this lower box or in this lower section of the, the login input panel right here. Now, when you first launch Skyglass and it's trying to make connection to the server, those will say on the left here, it will say version info, and then it'll say trying to connect or status uh, on the right. If those don't change and they remain that sort of version info and status or trying to connect, that means you have not made a successful connection to the login server. Okay, and you're never going to be able to log in because it can't connect. So uh, that could be due to a couple of reasons. Uh, most often, people have a VPN um, that's on that that the uh, Skyglass can't navigate through. Um, so just disable the VPN during login. You can turn it back on if you want after you've logged in. Um, and the other one is, you know, antivirus or firewalls that again are blocking Skyglass access to the internet or access to the login server. So if you need help configuring the this antivirus or um, firewall, you can reach out for, to me for help uh, on the website. VPNs, um, some VPNs work, others don't. Uh, I've heard that Nord, I think VPN is uh, one, one user said that he successfully uses that uh, to log in, but uh, most others are not usable um, as far as VPN goes. So um, any questions so far? No? All right, great, we'll move forward. So uh, creating a login is fairly simple. Um, uh, you have already gone to the website, downloaded the most recent version, uh, installed it or, or just decompress it if you're on a Mac. And you basically just enter a username, enter a password and enter the email and click on create. That's gonna generate an email uh, activation uh, email from skyglass.io. And uh, you just go to that, find your email, click on the link to activate, and you come back here and log in. Um, I like to also turn on this auto login so that the next time you launch Skyglass, it just blows right through. Um, so let me log in now. Great. And then once once you, the first time, if, if you don't have auto login, you'll get to this screen, which has a little button to go uh, enter Skyglass and will tell you how long your uh, license is current for. All right, so let's get into it. So first thing you're gonna to wanna to do most likely is scale user interface. So uh, on the bottom right-hand corner, you've got a couple of things um, that are active by default. The first row of, or this first vertical stack of buttons is the uh, main button stack on the bottom right. And at the top of that main button stack, you've got these uh, two little uh, double chevrons, um, and you'll notice that that's a button. When you hover over it, it turns green. You can click and drag on that to scale all the user interface options, and you'll notice that everything on, on all four corners uh, scales up with this. So based on your computer monitor, et cetera, you'll want to you know scale that up and down. I also use this while I'm using Skyglass, uh, depending if I'm you know doing certain things, if I've got a list panel that I want to sort of shrink down. Um, so it's something that I use often, uh, but for this today, I'm going to scale it up sort of abnormally or absurdly large, just so everybody can see what's going on. The next thing I'll also note here, uh, let me make this a little bit smaller so it's easier to see. You notice as I hover over stuff, there will be this little pop-up panel above the main stack and the auxiliary button stack with a little description on whatever I am uh, hovering over. Uh, the auto or the pop-up help is on uh, by default. That is this uh, button here with the um, question mark in a box at the lower section of the uh, main button stack. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just turn that off for now so I'm not distracted by it. Uh, but you can keep that on and just kind of move around sky glass and hover over stuff and get a quick description of what it is. Uh, all right, so let me scale that up again. All right, so to orient you, um, first, let's do camera stuff. Uh, let me clean up my interface a little bit, and I'll go over all those things a little bit later. So uh, while you, if you click and drag with your left button on the, with the, on top of the map, that's going to translate and simply moves the map around. If you right click, if you have a three button mouse and you right click, that's how you rotate the camera. All right. And if you hold down the option key on your keyboard and click with your left button and drag up and down, that 
elevates the camera position. Okay, so the first <clears throat> sort of uh, mental jump you need to make uh, with sky glass is, you know, because you're in a 3D space, there are, you know, sort of camera controls that you need to become aware of or accustomed to. And the, the key concept here is that there's a center of rotation. Okay, um, you, there are two ways to zoom inside of sky glass. You can zoom the map which change the scale of everything in your environment. And then you can zoom the camera in and out. You zoom the camera in and out by using the little scroll button or scroll wheel on your mouse. Okay. And as I scroll in here, you'll see it, uh, the center of my camera or my, you know, the center of my view port here is always going to be this little purple target. Okay. And that represents the center of rotation. And you can see as I click and I rotate around, that's, that's always going to be in the center. Even if I uh, translate the map around that little purple target, that's your visual indicator of your center of rotation. Okay. Um, we'll get into this a little bit more when I talk about the jumper um, because, and again, if you use that option key and, and drag, you can raise yourself off the map. And that can be a little, you know, strange if you're like, I can't get it to, to sort of rotate the right way. You're probably lifted off the map. And um, you'll need to either, you know, get yourself back on the map uh, surface and then scroll out. And then that's kind of more of a natural um, rotational position. Okay. Does that all make sense? All right. Steve, can I get a thumbs up? <laughs> okay, good. All right, super. Uh, so that's the camera basics, uh, scrolling and uh, rotating. I will also note there are keyboard commands for all this as well. The arrow keys on your keyboard uh, handle the rotation. You can't obviously see my, my fingers on the keys, but that handles rotation. And then for all your old, um, old uh, disco, um, keyboard warriors that did uh, Doom in the day and, and do, you know, uh, gaming on your with your keyboard, uh, the W a, S, and D keys are the translation keys. Um, and then also the Q and E will elevate your camera up and down. Um, so that may be a more efficient way for you to, you know, reposition the camera depending on what you're doing, uh, or you're obviously welcome to just drag it around or rotate it with your mouse. All right. Uh, let me restore the UI here. And... Um, there we go. All right, so let me talk about the user interface sort of in general. Uh, bottom right-hand corner where most of the controls and buttons and stuff like that are, uh, as I said before, this is the main button stack, this first um, vertical stack on the bottom right. And then you have the main auxiliary button stack, which I just call the, the you know, auxiliary button stack, um, which will populate out here on the uh, just to the left. And then as you change your settings, uh, depending on the context that you're running in Skyglass, you may have any number of additional pop-up panels, which will populate out to the left. And often they were going to, you know, stack up on top of each other here. Uh, let me turn on a couple just so you can see. Um, and the map too. <clears throat> Some of them will go off to the left, uh, such as the location chooser. Some of these are state dependent, meaning uh, when you change from mil, mil mode into standard mode, uh, some of these things will automatically be brought up. Um, but these are the pop-up panels off to the left. All right, so let me bring back sort of normal view here. All right, and turn traces off. Okay, great. So as I said, by default, uh, we had the pop-up help that it's on. Um, it also defaults into military mode uh, in auto refresh. So um, the military mode is governed by the shield icon. And when it's green, you know you're in mill mode. Um, and the auto refresh is uh, the you know clock with a couple of arrows above it. Um, this button here on the top, um, this is, uh, let me turn off auto refresh by clicking that button. And I'm gonna hit the burn button. We'll talk a, a little bit more about this later, but burn button basically clears the screen of all aircraft. It will also turn off auto refresh. The top button here, this basically loads a snapshot. Okay, so it is a loading function, but it doesn't keep refreshing. So we click on that. Um, you'll notice that the inside wheel or this little ring here, that is the progression bar of the current loading action. 
make this a little bit larger so it's easier to see. And then the outside ring, if you turn off or turn on auto refresh again, you'll see this sort of counts down like a timer. Um, hey, Thomas, welcome. Uh, counts down like a timer. So your two rings here are visual indicators of, of sort of progress and how far the auto refresh is going to um, takes to reload. Um, this main snapshot button icon will change depending on the state as well, as well as this little background color. In military mode, it's going to have a little fighter uh, with an orange color. When you pop into standard mode, this changed to more of a commercial aircraft with a blue uh, background. So that's kind of how you can quickly and easily see what mode you're in by looking at the uh, main load icon at the top. All right, so just uh, moving down the list here, the main button stack. Uh, the next one is to toggle on and off traces. Uh, and you can see this has a pop-up panel, which has a trace depth. Um, slider here. Uh, basically, the trace depth is how far back in time uh, the traces will paint or render on screen. Uh, trace data can be sort of expensive from a SkyGlass perspective. Traces are recorded, or rather position data is recorded in the system every five seconds. So as you can imagine, you know, one 24-hour trace will have more data uh, downloaded on screen than all the aircraft that are loaded right now. Um, so, uh, and they, you know, and the traces take memory, etc. So that is something if you have a lower powered machine, you want to be careful uh, to just tune the trace depth and your settings to, you know, maintain what you, what your computer can handle. And there's so many different levels or, lay, you know, uh, uh, levers within SkyGlass um, in, with his loading and things like that. So it, it's not hard to really max out almost any computer system by trying to load too much information uh, to, and render too much data. Uh, but we'll talk about how you can kind of, you know, keep that in, in the pocket for your machine. All right, I'll pause there for any questions so far. Okay, good. Thumbs up. Excellent. Okay, so uh, I'll turn off traces. Next button is a uh, screenshot. If you want to share out to social or share with a friend or just take a screenshot of what you're seeing, uh, that's a quick way to do that. This little camera icon will take a screenshot. Uh, the next one is the preference panel, which we're not going to go into in depth uh, today, but um, that's how you access your preferences. Again, we've got the pop-up help. And this last button on the bottom is a way to sort of minimize the user interface um, and uh, collapse all those and hide all those auxiliary stacks. If you have any of the type list or watch list panels, those will also be hidden. Uh, and then just click that to bring it back. Okay, um, let me go around the room here in the sense of uh, around the the user interface. Um, you know what's hidden on or what's on the screen. The bottom right hand corner is where you have all your bottom or your uh, button stacks and pop-ups, et cetera. This lower left-hand corner um, is where the, uh, let me turn on the type list panel real quick and my watch list. Uh, that's where any kind of list panels will populate uh, on the left-hand corner. Um, and there'll be handles where you can scale them uh, and they sort of auto adjust their column counts, et cetera. Um, and then, uh, this little yellow readout here on the bottom, uh, this was originally sort of a debug um, feedback, uh, but the beta testers, when we were you know first developing this thing, really seemed to like it, so I kind of kept it in there. Um, it's on by default. You can disable it by clicking on the SkyGlass uh, writing here, the logo itself. That will hide this little debug window, and if you want to keep a nice clean interface, you can do that. Um, but this basically tells you uh, what current Thing is sort of happening within SkyGlass if it's loading or uh, anything, and um, gives a little bit of feedback on the lo load times, etc. Um, if I click on the uh, load, you can see it it quickly pops around. If something went wrong, it should sort of hang at the or you know give an indication of what the last thing that you were doing. Uh, so it may or may not be helpful for you. The uh, little row here of badges. This is a feature that is going to be built out a little bit more in the future. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're a bug tester or you're, or you're a subscriber, or if you're a feeder, uh, you can sign up and, or get these little badges that will populate. 
Um, the top left-hand corner, that will have, it's got a couple of pieces of information. Uh, first, we got a date and time that's always on the screen in UTC and, you know, universal time code, Greenwich Mean, Greenwich mean Time over in Europe. Uh, just so that, you know, if you're seeing a screenshot within Skyglass um, that somebody took, you can always know exactly when it was taken. Uh, off to the right of that same line, we've got the home location that has been chosen uh, since I restarted and, you know, um, refreshed back to my defaults. That is sort of blank at this moment. And then underneath, uh, you have uh, the weather report uh, for the local area um, that you've chosen as a home. When you do refresh, uh, you know, reset to the default, um, it, it, uh, the default home state is CONUS, you know, continental United States, which is sort of in the middle. Um, and so this is just the weather readout for that general area. Um, let me show you how to change your home location real quick. If you're in military mode, you don't have the panel, um, the input panel activated. So first thing you want to do is um, in the auxiliary button stack in the second row, there'll be this target icon. Click on that target icon. You'll have this uh, new pop-up panel that will uh, show up. This enter new location, that is an input. Um, so let's just type in uh, LAX. Uh, this input, by the way, is sort of a natural language interpreter. Uh, you can put anything into it, uh, city name, um, state name, country name. Uh, you can type in the uh, something like Los Angeles Airport would work or the three-letter indicator of Los Angeles Airport, which is LAX. Um, some smaller airports uh, use, uh, even though you may know the three-letter identifier for it, you may need to put a K in front of that because that's actually, um, at least for the United States, uh, the, the four-letter is the ICAO code that will mostly get, uh, it'll understand that input. Uh, so anyway, Put in it. You can even put it. You know, type in a street address with a with a number, etc. Anything it'll take. Uh, so let's just type in LAX. Hit enter, and that will rehome your location, your home location over to that area. You'll see um, LAX also populates in the top left hand corner, and then you have this uh, the latitude and longitude will read out there as well. Um, so let's just do that again. We'll type in DCA. You can hit enter or you can click on the target button. And um, again, this does two things. It, it changes your home location to whatever you entered, and then it also moves your camera over. Um, so you can move your camera around and click on that again. It's going to pop your camera back, um, although we haven't updated the home location in that action. Uh, and then you can, do, let's do something else, type in Texas. And that's going to put, reset the home back over to that uh, you know, to the center of the state. And then you'll see that the uh, weather also updates with every uh, home location change. All right. Um, when you're in standard mode, this home location is much more important, but we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Okay. So finishing out the walkabout here, um, I'll make this a little bit smaller. On the top right-hand corner, we've got a bunch of th different things happening. Uh, I'm going to lower the screen just so that as I cover this section um, in the recording, I tend to hang out. My, my camera's up on the top right, um, so this covers it up. Uh, the top right-hand corner, uh, the first thing you'll see is this um, uh, count line. First thing it says last load. This technically is um, in the last loading action, how many aircraft were downloaded you know, to memory. Um, not necessarily what's showing. Uh, because, you know, depending on your settings, certain things will be filtered out, uh, ground traffic may be filtered out, etc. So in this instance, we had 583 that were downloaded, 424 are showing. Um, <clears throat> then there'll be a breakout of the count of military and masked. Um, and then this number in parentheses that it has a negative, that talks about in the last loading action, how many were removed meaning we had some stale aircraft that were removed uh, because they timed out or weren't updated again um, or simply landed, to, you know, any number of things. And then this last one is the on-screen count. You'll notice that as you move up in or out, um, it actually updates quite quickly of only what's on the screen. So if we get in here, 
real close. You can see, yeah, we've only have three uh, or just a handful that are on screen. And then as you zoom out, that number will, will tick up. Um, military mode loads all aircraft worldwide. Okay, there, there's no uh, search radius that's affected um, when you're in military mode. It just does it worldwide. If I scroll uh, pretty far back and kick the kick the camera over so you can see Europe, etc., you can see even though they're not on screen, depending on your rotation, etc., and your orientation, uh, they did load and they are rendered. Um, okay, so that's the first line of the top right hand corner. Uh, top right hand corner I refer to as the HUD or heads up display. Um, as you hover over any um, traffic, <clears throat> any target, you'll see that that uh, updates. Um, let me get one sort of, in, there we go, on center screen. Um, you'll, you'll notice that that will update with a bunch of information. Uh, and it's, the, it's mimicked with the same pop-up labels that, that are there over the aircraft as you hover over each one. So you have the... Uh, top left-hand corner, we get the aircraft type. In this case, it's C-17. Um, <clears throat> top right-hand corner is the call sign. And then uh, let me focus on the HUD here. Uh, underneath the type, the aircraft type, you've got this four-digit identifier or, or code. That is the current transponder code. Uh, that's what the uh, what they call is you know what the aircraft is squawking at the time. Um, and then underneath the call sign, we have the aircraft registration and country. Um, this country is not something that's actually broadcast from the aircraft. It's just decoded based on the um, aircraft registration or actually the, um, the hexadecimal code, uh, which is this next field, um, the hex code. Hex code is the unique identifier for the transponder itself. Uh, so like on your phone, you've got what's called a, you know, a UUID, a UUID. Um, universal identifier. That's kind of the, the equivalent for aircraft transponders, this hexadecimal code. It's always six letters uh, and numbers and, uh, you know, A through F. Um, and so uh, Skyglass is sort of um, hex-centric, uh, meaning if you, you can easily search on hex codes, uh, you can add via hex code. Um, most the, of the queries, you know, on the back end, I do via hex code. Um, so that's a, a handy thing to have and, and pass around if you or grab if you're in another app like another flight tracking app that's in 2D. Uh, grab the hex code, come back over to your Skyglass, paste, etc. Um, you'll notice as I hover over certain elements of the HUD, we get this green box. Um, if a box shows up in in green around it, or the text itself turns green in some other areas, uh, or something like that, that's an indicator that if you then click on it, it puts that information that's highlighted in green on your clipboard. Uh, so that's a quick way to grab certain information like the registration or the call sign or the hex code. Just click on it. You'll see it turned orange. And then now that information is on your clipboard. The next section below that is the telemetry. We've got the current uh, altitude of that aircraft, the speed in knots. Uh, below the altitude is the uh, altitude change, and that's going to be in feet per minute. Um, I will note that the uh, altitude is always reported in barometric pressure, all right? And so uh, if there's any meteorologists or uh, pilots out there, you'll know that uh, um, barometric pressure is something that changes per location. It's sort of, uh, it all depends on the weather and the pressure of the um, actual location. So you can have, uh, let's say at a, at a field, um, at an airport, the barometric altitude may be lower or higher, almost guaranteed it's going to be different than the actual field elevation. Um, so, uh, and because everything is reported, uh, you know, all air transponders report in barometric pressure, as soon as an aircraft takes off, they might re be reporting an altitude that that is technically below ground. Um, for if you, you know, if you haven't made the conversion from ground elevation from barometric. So, um, We'll talk about that a little bit later when we talk about the sliders, but there's a, uh, a way to manually adjust for that barometric change or difference. Uh, and that makes sense if you're, you know, zoomed in um, close to a, uh, a sp specific airport. Okay, so uh, you'll also see, let me find a, something that's uh, got a deviation. There we go. Uh, so this one's 22,000 feet. The change of elevation, it is descending. So we've got a little red triangle pointing down. 
uh, negative 1,554 feet per minute. And then the final uh, bottom right-hand corner of this HUD will have the uh, current track uh, or the heading of that aircraft. Moving to the left of the HUD, we've got a plane spotter uh, image. So this is an actual image of the aircraft, the actual aircraft, not just a type specific one. Um, this is sourced from plane spotter and uh, which is a crowdsourced um, place where, you know, folks who will go out and, um, uh, you know, sit at the field and take pictures of aircraft and they can upload them, you know, and, and they're specifically marked to an aircraft. Not all uh, aircraft have a plane spotter image, uh, but if it does, it will be uh, downloaded. If you click on this image, you get a larger version of that, of that image. And then um, let me make this a little bit smaller. Um, get him loaded again. And then if you uh, notice in the bottom right-hand corner of this larger image, we've got a little info button. If you click on that, that'll actually load the plane spotter page for this aircraft so you can get some more detail about it or do you know some deeper digging. Uh, clicking on that image again, will bring it back to a smaller size. And then uh, on the left-hand side of all that information, you've got a number of buttons uh, and then a you know, larger profile image of the icon. Um, and uh, what is good to note here, let me make this a little bit larger. What's important to note here is um, depending on which of these icons or uh, buttons are, are clicked, you may get some additional information below the HUD. Uh, by default, the location pop-up or pop out is enabled. If I turn this off, you can see that goes away. We click on that again. This gives you a, um, a lookup of that specific uh, aircraft type and their manufacturer, um, and also a little uh, reverse geocode um, of the aircraft's reported position. So you've got the latitude and longitude here on the left, and then a, a vector and distance to the nearest metropolitan area, okay? Um, in this case, you got 17 miles southwest of Petaluma, Canada, and then the local time uh, of that time zone where that aircraft is reported. Okay, um, the I'll turn that uh, distance and uh, location off. Let me turn on the um, uh, tower. That will do a little bit of, um, uh, it'll display some additional data um, that is reported by the aircraft in military mode, uh, most often you're not going to get uh, some of these, um, you know, they're going to be left blank. Uh, in standard mode, though, you do get some more uh, detail. Some of that detail is um, the source type refers to uh, how the transponder is actually broadcasting, if it's in ADS-B mode uh, or if it's old technology mode S, you'll get that. Uh, if it's uh, broadcasting what its category. There are uh, half a dozen different categories from, you know, light aircraft uh, up to heavies to airships. That'll be displayed here. And then what I find interesting is this, often they'll have a nav mode. Uh, do they have air um, autopilot? If the autopilot's on, uh, if it has TCAS, which is a collision avoidance system, it'll have some different information, some of that stuff that's actually broadcast from the transponder, and we can capture it in the system and display it. Uh, this last one, this rad C stands for radius of containment. And that is basically a, um, a number in meters representing the confidence of that position. Um, in ADSB, that's going to be a pretty tight number, 15 to 75 meters. Uh, if it's mode S, it could be um, you know several hundred meters or more. Um, but that's what that rad C means. If you have your database uh, enabled, then it'll do the lookup of the um, uh, owner operator and the registration, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, okay, so that covers the pop-ups, which are these three buttons here. Um, if you wanna add this aircraft to the watch list, that's this banner icon. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more when we touch on the watch list. This uh, uh, hourglass is to turn on uh, or go into flight history mode for this specific aircraft. Um, if you wanna run a flight history on just that aircraft, that's this button. Uh, I'm not gonna go over that in this uh, um, live training. And then this last one, uh, this uh, little horseshoe magnet, uh, when you turn that on, this goes into follow mode. And basically what that does is it keeps whatever this aircraft that's in the HUD, uh, if, if you're 
auto refresh is on uh, 30 seconds, let's say, uh, one third of that, every 10 seconds in that instance, uh, it'll go look up that location and keep the camera focused in on that aircraft specifically. <coughs> Excuse me. Any questions as I pause for a drink? Yeah, I've, I have one. Um, does the uh, upper right hand box there, does it ever give you any information about um, specifically military, about what group or squadron or any of that information? No. no. Okay. That would be a very cool thing. Um, yeah. I, I'd love to be able to decode what branch. But again, this is just what the transponder uh, is broadcasting. The whole system is transponder specific. Um, so um, let me just touch on that uh, in case you all didn't know. Uh, all of this data is crowdsourced, meaning there are <clears throat> almost um, just below, I think, 10,000 people across the planet uh, that have little antennas up on their roofs, uh, you know, connected to Raspberry Pis, connected to these little uh, SDR, software-defined radio dongles, and um, they're receiving the transmissions from all the aircraft that are flying at the moment. And that all that data, you know, gets uh, decoded by that Raspberry Pi and then uploaded to the uh, ADSB Exchange network. Um, and then that's where I grab my feed. Um, you know, so I pay for access to that data source. Um, what makes that unique is most other um, non-crowd based, even though like there are some other competitors that, that do have feeders, you know, in their network, they also have... Um, contracts with the FAA, they get some of their data from the FAA. And the FAA requires, if you have a relationship with them, requires uh, certain data that are part of their masked programs to be filtered out of public view. So it's not that these these aircraft are not transponding. Um, if they're part of the, you know, controlled airspace, uh, flying in controlled airspace and under ATC control, etc., they're going to be broadcasting. But it just means when that data comes in through their system before it gets released to the public, that can be filtered out. Uh, ADSB Exchange has no relationships um, with those folks. So they're going to get, you know, this is sort of the raw data view of the sky. You're going to see everything. And because it's crowdsourced, um, there's a lot of folks that take time identifying, hey, that's a military aircraft that becomes part of their database. Uh, so we can identify who's military um, and who's, uh, you know, part of a masked program. Um, there's also been some FOIA requests that have been uh, released and made part of the database. So that's how they've been able to decode certain aircraft has been part of the um, masked system. We'll talk about that when we get into standard mode a little bit more. But anyway, so it's all feeder specific. Uh, that will does mean, though, that once you get out about 300 miles off any coastline, um, you're not going to get data because there's no feeder out there. Uh, most feeders are going to be terrestrially based, so that's why you never really see, even though you know there's going to be aircraft flying over the, um, the uh, you know, different oceans, you're, you're probably not going to see that aircraft unless it's being picked up by some island feeder, or um, it's interesting, um, there's some amazing capabilities in the ADSB system. Uh, ADSB means uh, Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast. It's simply the protocol that the uh, transponders were mandated by the FAA in 2020. Uh, any aircraft under um, air traffic controls control had to be in that, uh, had to have that type of transponder. Uh, that was actually how I came up with the idea of doing Skyglass. I looked at that uh, mandate and looked at the data that was going to be coming off that feed and went, oh man, we can put this in a game engine and have some fun. So that's what I did. Um, so anyway, ADSB does some very interesting things. Um, there are ground towers which will repeat uh, data. Um, certain transponders that are flying can also repeat the the signals. So um, most signals uh, when they're on the ground, like a ground antenna like mine here um, on my roof, I'll pick up about 300 miles. But I occasionally will get data from aircraft that are farther out because it's being passed along from another aircraft, or if you're near a, uh, you know, an FAA or an ATC um, uh, ground tower, you can pick up information or stuff from, from that. So uh, all that stuff put together, uh, that's why you may get something like this guy 
uh, who's you know clearly way out over the coast. Um, he may or may not be over an island, but um, you'll get some aircraft over the oceans. Anyway, uh, long story short, um, it's all feeder based and it's all based on what the transponder is broadcasting. So again, back to your question, no, we don't have, um, uh, we can do a, some lookups through the database if that's enabled like the owner operator, um, but um, nobody's got a database that actually maps, you know, transponder or tail number to branch uh, or something like that. I will say though, that depending on the um, uh, call sign, you can interpret a few things like this PAT aircraft, that's a priority air transport, something, uh, you know, one of the data points I learned from Monkey, uh, one of the thousand things that I've learned from watching his sit reps. Um, uh, reach aircraft, that's going to be, uh, you know, typical of them moving, uh, you know, equipment around. You'll see these uh, K-35Rs, which are uh, usually tankers. Sometimes if they're refueling, they'll be called an oiler or something like that. That's kind of that indicator. Uh, anyway, all right. So sorry to be so long-winded about that, but that was a good question. All right. Any other questions before I move forward? You mentioned, uh, was it feeder equipment that you've yes. got? How expensive is that, and what's the availability to the general public? Well, perfectly available to the general public. Oh, I will mention that other caveat. Um, in certain provinces or you know places in around the world, like China, it's it's illegal to feed. So we have very few, very little coverage over um, China. Uh, we have pretty, uh, and so in, in super remote areas, you're also not going to be you know have feeders. Other than that, though, because of the range. Um, you're, there's pretty good coverage. Over the United States, it's almost ubiquitous. Um, there is actually a link on the ADSB Exchange website that gives like a heat map and also a feeder map so you can see where the hot spots and or low, low spots are. But it's, um, for our intents and purposes, it's pretty ubiquitous. With regard to feeding, um, here is, this is a one that I sell. I actually make these myself. Um, this is a, what's what I call the breath mint. Um, this is sort of a mobile feeding unit, but it's good to sort of demonstrate just the, here, let me stop sharing so you can see it full screen. There we go. All right. Kind of show you the components. Um, the pieces on the, on the left, whatever side this is, on this side are the most important. At the bottom here, we've got a Raspberry Pi. That's the microcomputer, which drives the whole thing. Uh, that's, this one is Wi-Fi enabled, so it reaches out to my network, and that's how that feeds up to the system. This piece here, this is the SDR. This is really the, the key ingredient um, in feeding. Um, you can buy, you can, you can home grow, you know, do it yourself for all of these things. You can get an SDR, plug it into your computer. You can get it uh, and then do a bunch of decoding yourself. Um, and then this SDR stands for Software Defined Radio. This one is made by ADSB Exchange. Um, I use theirs because the, this specific SDR has a filter um, components inside that filter out everything except for the frequency that we're looking for. In this case, for ADSB, it's uh, 1090 megahertz. Um, other SDRs are general, and you're going to get a lot of noise, or they might be tuned to another frequency. Anyway, so the SDR is the really the, the important one here. Um, and then when you buy the SDR from SD, uh, ADSB Exchange, you get this little six-inch whip antenna. And then in, in this format, I've just got hooked up to a battery, which, you know, lasts about 10 hours. So you can take this on the road and feed mobily. Um, the, I also sell um, a sort of private label version of the ADSB Exchange feeder, which is a dual band feeder that does ADSB protocol, as well as the older uh, 978 megahertz, the mode S. Um, I don't have those, one of those I can just grab and show you, but we do do them in this, I, I had them do it in this beautiful sort of sky blue, uh, or you can get their sort of classic silver or gray. Um, the cost on these, I believe I sell the breath mints at about um, 200 and, or 300, I'd have to look. Um, and then the, um, the uh, ADSB exchange ones that I resell uh, for the same prices you can get them on their website but if you want the sky blue you got to come to sky glass or AVR labs uh, those are like I think I should just look it up let me give you the exact one sorry about that let me uh, I didn't I mean to didn't mean to hold you up but it's just something I was you know interested in uh, yeah yeah 
No worries here. Let me share my screen again. Uh, right, we'll go to desktop. And here's the website. And then, so the gear is under the AVR Labs gear. There's feeder hardware. And then uh, let's check the prices. So the, um, the dual band feeder, you can see a picture of it there. Uh, $399 for the base unit that comes with these two little whip antennas. Uh, and then uh, for another 90 bucks, you get the um, this external antenna. This is a dual band uh, antenna. Um, and then if you mount this on a pole, you know, or on top of your roof, you get really tremendous range that comes with a 25 foot cable. So this bundle together, plug and play, uh, just under $500 or right about 500 bucks. And then I sell the, the breath mints, this little mobile unit, um, which you can, you know, plug onto a wall wart and be, um, you know, permanent uh, without just going with the, uh, you know, battery and went for two ninety nine. All right. That's awesome. Uh, feeders make the whole thing go. I love feeders. They're, they're awesome. Um, the whole thing just impresses me. Uh, the only thing I didn't talk about with that is that on that Raspberry Pi, there is a uh, SD uh, micro SD card, and that actually is the software that makes this whole thing run. The ADSB Exchange system has uh, what's called an image, and you download that that image and then um, put that onto the Raspberry Pi SD card, and that is actually what tells it you know how to send it up to ADSB Exchange and all that kind of thing. Um, if you do have a feeder, you can look at your private feed you know, your specific antenna's feed inside a sky glass. So that, that's also capable. You can do that locally on your local network, or you can do that remotely. Um, I will be doing a deep dive on that at some point. Okay. That's awesome. I mean, if you can add, you know, data to the system that you're engaged in, um, that's awesome. And it, <clears throat> even if you're in a major, a major metropolitan area, I mean, redundancy is security, right? So, and there's people that, you know, um, surprisingly, as I talked to the, you know, the founder, um, he told me that it's, um, some people only have them on during the day, which is kind of wild. So you can look at the number of feeders during the day, and there's a sort of basic sine wave of the 24 hour clock, uh, which I figured, you know, I keep mine on all 24 seven, but some people don't. So anyway, uh, feeders are awesome. Uh, if you do buy one of my feeders, I do give you a year of sky glass access included. Um, and, um, uh, I will also say that if you are in a remote area and you will be the, the first feeder, um, I may be able to get you a free one from the ADSB Exchange guys. They will sponsor feeders in remote areas or places where there is currently no coverage. Um, if you're in uh, downtown Dallas, I'm sorry, there are lots of feeders there. So <laughs> I can't get a free one. But, uh, you know, I have actually arranged for folks in, um, uh, got one in a remote part of California. I got one in um, uh, one in Australia for free. So uh, anyway, if you're in an, and you can check those maps on ADSB Exchange to see, you know, is there feeder coverage? And if you're in a in a in an empty spot, then we can get you a free feeder. Uh, yeah. Anyway, and if you want to do that, you can just reach out to me, and I can uh, start that process for you. That sounds okay. good. I'll, I will probably. Cool. All right, so we've talked about the HUD. We've gone over all four corners. Uh, let's come back to the auxiliary button stack and talk about um, all the buttons. Before I do that, let me talk about the aircraft on screen. Um, all right, so let me zoom in here so we can just get that one AC looking at it. Okay, you'll notice that um, in, the, in default mode, the aircraft icons are on by default. That's the thing, thing in, the, in the octagon. You'll also notice there's a little chevron underneath that. Um, the chevron represents the actual aircraft position in space. Okay, so that's actually the aircraft, the little the little triangle chevron. Um, there are three colors on screen. You'll see uh, there there's this red tint. That one's sort of an easy one to see. Uh, red, green, or blue. Um, red means it's descending. Green means it's climbing. And blue means it's level flight. Level flight meaning plus, you know, or minus 50 from zero. So if it's less than 50 feet per minute, it's going to be reported as a level flight. Um, okay, so you'll get this teal blue, a uh, green, like these guys, or you'll get a red. Uh, but again, the the triangle, the little aircraft, uh, the sort of um, uh, 
what are the um not, not the death star kind of looks like this star wars big freighter anyway that's the aircraft position this I, um, octagon with the aircraft uh profile icon that represents sort of like a, a compass face so the orientation of that um, profile icon is showing what direction it is if that were a compass face so this guy is obviously going uh, westerly 271 degrees almost due west uh, this guy's going pretty much due east 409 uh, i'm sorry uh, 90 94 degrees 95 degrees uh, so that's kind of a quick visual indication you can tell what direction they're flying based on uh, that um you know, rotation inside that space. You'll also notice as I move and rotate that octagon always faces the camera. So you'll always be able, all the labels, <clears throat> all of the aircraft labels um, will always face the camera regardless of the orientation. Whereas the, uh, the Chevron itself, the position that shows, you know, what, where it's pointing um, and will actually take up some bank and some, you know, some uh, pitch and, and roll, et cetera. <clears throat> based on what's being, uh, you know, what, what the aircraft's doing. <clears throat> Excuse me, got a frog in my throat. All right. So um, let's go back down unless we have any questions. I'll keep moving. Okay, great. Um, in the auxiliary button stack, let me make this a little bit larger again. Uh, from, let me move from the, uh, let me, Quickly address this first thing. On top of the aux button stack, you've got this little readout of when the last load happened. Okay, uh, if you're not in auto refresh mode, that will still be active. Um, but this gives you an idea of how stale the position data is that's on screen. Okay, um, you can turn your auto refresh on and dial it down to one second, and that, you know, is almost constant. Um, the latency in the system, by the way, is is like a tenth of a second. It's incredibly fast. Um, uh, if you're standing on a runway and watch this thing update, I mean, it's it's like it's spot on. The latency in the in the overall system is just is magical, in my opinion. I'm very impressed with the ADSB Exchange guys. Uh, but if you have this auto refresh at like uh, let's make it 10 seconds. Let's make an easy example. And I'm going to turn off auto refresh. You'll see this last load time will start to count up. And then once it reaches a multiple of, of whatever your auto refresh timing is, it'll change different colors. So once we get out to 30, it's going to turn yellow. And then once you get past that, it's going to turn red, giving you an indication of like, hey, this data is a little old. You should auto, you know, turn on auto refresh or, re or re um, take another snapshot. As you can see there, we crossed 30, now we're in yellow. And I think when we get past 40, it's going to turn red. Um, you know, as I said, auto refresh is on by default. Um, however, uh, there may be instances where you want to turn it off and just kind of take a, take a snapshot. Um, so that's this little indicator of how, how old your data is. Um, I guess, uh, let's see here, at 60 seconds, it's going to turn red? No. Okay, well, it does it does turn red once once you get longer. Um, at any rate, uh, let me turn auto refresh back on. We'll get those things updated again. All right. So uh, the auxiliary button stack. Let's start from the bottom. We've got this big map zoom um, uh, slider here with a few buttons. If you want to increment the map zoom, you know, by one level at a time, you can use these buttons. Um, uh, you'll notice that sometimes when you do that, though. The um, the map system gets a little funky, like I like I have it here. The tiles get all wonky. Everything doesn't look right. That middle button will reload, pretty much dumps all the tiles and reloads them. So that's how you can correct that anomaly. Um, sadly, that's a bug in the in the map box system, and I don't have control over that. So I had to kind of make that work around. That's what this button is: refresh all the tiles. Uh, you can also grab this slider and move it. Um, I will say though that um, I don't like to grab and drag because it's very taxing on the system. Uh, meaning every time you make a slight increment, it's gonna try and reload all the tiles, which can you know, make the experience kind of uh, wonky and, and uh, jittery. Uh, I like to sort of you know, get familiar with the scale and then just you know, click to move the slide directly into where I'm gonna be. Uh, middle is sort of a you know, city view. Um, 
let me turn on my location picker and put in, uh, let's say, Miami view here. And you'll see this is kind of like a city. You'll probably get the, the um, profile. Uh, if you're zoomed in, you'll see the, uh, the uh, there's the airport, Miami International Airport. Um, I can put in MIA, which is should be the airport. No, oh, I guess not. Let's do KMIA. There we go. KMIA, that's the four-letter identifier for uh, Miami Airport. You can see it there. Um, if I scroll out, you can kind of see the, the distance that we're getting with that kind of a map zoom level. You can zoom all the way in and get on the field. I mean, it's really tight. We do that now. In fact, probably won't, you know, this is so zoomed in, you'll probably get more than the field. Yeah, I'll check that out. Um, uh, you can also turn on, uh, if we turn the, bring the map style button here, you've got some elevation and buildings. We can turn the buildings on. Uh, you can see them uh, sort of painted there. Uh, the buildings and the elevation, uh, those take more memory. So I have them off by default, uh, but depending on your settings, again, um, also the buildings will not show if you're zoomed out to a certain level. It's only when you're kind of at the city view uh, mode, but fully, and I'm not even fully, you know, zoomed in yet. Uh, full zoom is like you're at a city block. You know, you're really super tight. Uh, I tend to be at sort of this mid-level, so we can kind of get a region, you know, city view, uh, or back here at the uh, continental sort of, uh, you know, um, hemispheric view almost. Uh, if you go all the way out, you can see pretty much the whole globe. I'll wait for those tiles to fill in. Um, but you are going to get some, let me refresh the tiles, you are going to get some anomalies because you were so far zoomed in, it's got more, you know, sort of tiles than we do have Earth. Um, so you get some little repeats on the, you know, North and South Poles. But here you can actually get, you know, there's the entire world on a flat map um, in one view. All right, so I, again, I like to kind of hover in this top uh quadrant here. That's what's by default, which will give you, you know, good view of CONUS, etc. Uh, all right, let me go back to the home area. All right, let me put in uh, CONUS. All right. Okay. All right, so uh, that covers the map zoom. Uh, moving up to this next level, this is sort of a map centric, uh, different, um, you know, features and levers. Uh, we were we got this first one, the middle one up now. This sort of folded map will will pull up um, the map style uh, swatches here. Uh, the default is the satellite view. Um, I sort of tend to do like a dark sort of a dark mode uh, with this green. There's also sort of a, a gray. Um, which can be nice depending on uh, your purpose. Um, I kind of like the, the gr this green and blue uh, because uh, when you're looking at traces, it has a really nice sharp contrast on the traces, et cetera. Uh, there are some lighter map styles. Um, I will say though that if you um, do have th these lighter map styles, uh, you may want to adjust the colors um, of the traces so that you get a better, you know, make them darker uh, rather than sort of the bright, uh, bright colors that are the default. Uh, so for this case, uh, let's keep going with this nice little dark green. And um, all right, so that, and like I said, we, we if you want the elevation to show, you can toggle that it does require more RAM, um, or more memory from the computer. So if you're trying to optimize, you can keep those low. And again, that's not really that practical when you're at this sort of continental view. It's only really useful if you're in a mountainous area and you've zoomed your map in, okay? And you're working sort of more of a regional uh, orientation. All right, so let me turn off the map uh, options. And then we've got these, uh, the two, uh, one we talked about the target, this is the um, home location chooser. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit more detail with the search radius later. And then we have, so let me turn that off. And then we've got this, uh, the vertical sliders. Uh, they're on by default. Um, and this is really the first, you know, real magic of Skyglass. Um, these two vertical sliders, uh, the first, the left one is the scale of every aircraft. So you can change the scale um, 
you know, to suit your needs and your, your eyesight level, <laughs> depending on how old you are. Some of those old fogies are, we need a little bit larger. Um, and you can use the scale to sort of declutter, you know, your view, et cetera. Um, this will also change the scale of all of the panels, uh, the pop-up panels um, for every aircraft and also the thickness of the traces. Okay, so this is the, the scaler. Um, this is also really useful when you change your map zoom, you may wanna dial in, you know, the uh, size um, based on the map zoom level, meaning as you zoom in, you'll probably wanna make those a little bit larger. You zoom out, make them a little bit smaller, et cetera. Okay, but this, this uh, right vertical slider, this is really the magic of sky glass. This is the relative height slider. So this basically stretches and squishes the relative height of all the different aircraft. If you take that relative height slider and bring it all the way down, the furthest, you know, fully depressed, that is actually, that's actual altitude based on the map zoom. So first thing I discovered when I did this is, you know, when I actually, you know, coded like actual altitude, I mean, when you're zoomed out like this, might as well have a flat map. I mean, it really doesn't give you much, you know, you can't really tell who's high and who's low. So I made this little, um, uh, you know, visualization tool, stretch it, everybody out. Now you can very easily see, kick it off to the side, your camera off to the side, you can see who's at the higher flight levels and who's down low very, very easily. Um, if you are zoomed in on your map, you'll want to bring this down because when you when the map zoom is in, most of those higher flyers are going to be way off screen and you can't tell. Uh, so if we were like in our Miami example, um, if you're down at a field elevation, you want to bring that all the way down, and then you get a nice variation of the uh, aircraft elevation, even at actual altitude uh, renderings. Make sense? Okay, good. All right. Uh, moving up from, oh, and, uh, to finish with that, um, so there's a little button on the top of the uh, vertical sliders. Click on that. You see it uh, reveals two more sliders. This is how you can adjust your mouse sensitivity make it faster or slower. Um, and then this is the barometric pressure uh, manual adjuster. Uh, only again, really useful if you're zoomed in on an airport elevation. And let's say, for example, if you see the traces go below the map surface level, you can bump those up so that everything matches and that's sort of giving you a manual uh, barometric uh, adjustment. If you click on the uh, little temperature um, thermometer at the bottom, that will zero out that change if you made a change. Uh, okay, so I can, let me collapse those again and we'll keep moving forward. Any questions? Okay, excellent. All right. So the next group is, um, the list panels that are available in the sky glass. We've got a type list panel. I'll pull that up now. A watch list panel and a favorite locations panel. I'll pull that up as well. <clears throat> the type list panel that will show up here on the left, again, in the top right hand of that panel, you've got a little uh, um, a widget to resize. Um, and based on the width, it'll resize uh, you know, into different numbers of columns or you can bring this down. Um, the default, uh, by default, the type list panel will do a count of all the different aircraft types and then put them in that order, uh, you know, highest count and the to, to lowest count. Um, if you'll notice in the type list header here, this far right hand icon, clicking on that will change from count uh, ranking to alphabetic. So this is how you can, if you know you're like looking for a Q4, for me, it's very hard to find, you know, by scanning if it's in count mode. So we put it in, in uh, alphanumeric and then you can quickly, you know, uh, isolate that aircraft type that you're looking for. Uh, clicking on, we'll stay with a Q4, clicking on a type will isolate that type and you'll see that it turns blue. And then we'll also open up this other, uh, let me make this, like that, there we go. We'll also start populating this other pop-out of the aircraft, the list of aircraft of that type. So in Q4, we only have one aircraft. It's the score 47, so we can see it here. If you click on the entry in the aircraft list panel, it's gonna jump to that aircraft, all right? Um, but again, we're 
If you click on a type, it's going to go into isolate mode, isolate only that type. You can gang those up. If I click on the pH, you'll see that turns blue as well. And I get those two aircraft uh, now listed in my um, aircraft list panel. Uh, let me pick the K35Rs. We've got 20 of those. Boom. You'll see now we've got all those now listed. And you'll see that the, um, the view is starting to fill out. Uh, let me turn my mouse zoom back. There we go. Okay, that's better. Okay. Um, there we go. So as I again, as I click on these different aircraft types, I'm I'm in isolate mode. They're going to turn blue. Um, if you want to back out any of these isolate changes and go back to the regular mode, you can click on the two arrows in a circle here in the in the type header. And that's going to remove all of your uh, isolate selections, and everything will show back up on the screen. Um, you can also do that sort of in reverse. So let me go back to the count mode, and let's say these text twos; these are all going to be uh, trainers. Get that to like this. There we go. Uh, if I right click on the aircraft type. It turns red, and that means that it's actually hidden that that type of aircraft from the count and the view. So I can do that. It's like I'll take out the NAs and the B-30s, all the Blackhawks, um, T-38s, and now we've got sort of a much simplified, much more simplified view on screen here uh, because we pulled out a bunch of those aircraft. Uh, that might be useful. This is one of the things that Monkey does. He pulls out the trainers, and then you know moves the camera oriented to just over the conus and then you got this on screen count of you know sort of uh, what's active and and sort of in mission mode not training mode 158 in that in this example and again uh, you can have hide and isolate uh, ganged up together um, let me turn the p8s on my k35rs yeah see there they are um, c30s c17s and then to clear out all those selections, um, there you just click on the reset button here on the type list panel header, and that will remove all those selections. Okay, uh, any questions at this point on the type list panel? Okay, so each type list entry has a few things. Obviously, you've got the aircraft icon, uh, the profile icon there. You've got the the readout of the of uh, what type it is. You've got the count, and then if you wanted to turn on traces for all those aircraft of that type, you've got a little button here. So let's do that for the K three K thirty five Rs. And I'm first I'm going to isolate them just so we can see them easier. And I'm going to click on this trace icon, and then uh, you'll notice once I've activated traces, whether I have it on or off in the main button stack, it's going to automatically turn on. And then we've got this uh, trace depth slider that's active. Right now, they're set at 30 minutes. So you can bump that up. Let's make that three hours. We'll see they'll, they'll go away and then they'll repopulate again. So this is how you can kind of get a quick, uh, quick make quick work of seeing where the, where the routes are, where their little re marshaling patterns have been uh, based on the history. Okay. And this is, uh, now that we've got some good traces on screen, whoops, you'll see if I if I change the depth, I'm sorry, the, uh, the size, you can see those thicken and um, get smaller. All right. You'll also notice in the type list entry, you've got this, this color swatch, which represents the beginning and ending uh, trace color scheme that's, that's defaulted for that aircraft. Um, when you first install Skyglass, it basically uh, randomizes um, all the, we, there's about 400 types that are known. Um, and then it's just gonna pick random start and end colors for those, but you can, you can change them. Clicking on the swatch will pull up this little color picker. Uh, so you've got the full color spectrum here. Uh, notice that on the top, you do have, you know, it, the lighter colors at the bottom are the darker hues of that. Um, so let's tune this K35R, uh, trace color. So I'm going to pick something like on a red, um, sort of in the middle here, click start. And you'll notice that there's a, um, 
a preview of the trace here, and then you'll see it, up, it updated on screen as well. So let me make the ending trace a brighter blue, click end, and now you can see that update. So the end color is at the back of the aircraft. It's the last known position. It ends at the aircraft. The start is the oldest uh, position of the depth that you've chosen. So in this case, six hours, probably where they you know took off from if they've got an endurance less than six hours. Um, if you've got something like a 30 minute, you'll see that trace is short. But again, the first or the oldest position is the start and the most current uh, last known position is the end position. And then to close that uh, color picker, you can just click on the, box, the X box there and it'll uh, close that. And you can also see the uh, swatch has been updated with our new color scheme. So that's how you can tune the colors of all the different types based on you know, what you're trying to do. Uh, and also get kind of a quick visual indication of you know, the, the path of that. Um, all right, so let me get some longer traces there for giggles. You'll notice as I try and do stuff as it was trying to work, um, let me pick a longer trace and you'll see at the bottom of this um, auxiliary button stack, you'll get this little window that'll pop up says, please wait. That means something's, you know, Skyglass is churning on something. It basically means you, you may have some jerky camera movements while it's while the processor is working on something else, downloading or rendering um, certain information. Once that goes away, um, then you've got you're pretty much guaranteed to have nice snappy um, camera moves and you know translation moves, etc. Okay, let's bring on another one. And uh, anything else to talk about in the type list panel? Uh, not so much other than to close it. You can either click on the um, type list icon in the button stack, or you can just close it here using the X. Um, and then you'll notice as I close the type list panel, it backs out any of the isolate or hide selections that you made and brings everybody back on screen. Um, it will keep those traces uh, rendered. So if you want to turn off your, tr or to unload all traces, you simply just turn them off and they'll unload. And then you can turn it back on if you want to start doing more trace work. Okay, um, while we're talking about traces, let me talk about that for a little bit. <clears throat> um, when you are in you know, this sort of mode uh, and traces are on, you can click on any aircraft and it will load that trace. Clicking on that aircraft again will unload the trace. So this is how you can kind of one by one you know, go into an area, paint some traces. Uh, but again, the trace color, beginning and end trace is type specific. It's not aircraft specific. So if you want to tune those colors, go into the type list panel, and then you can, you can make those changes there. All right. But again, if you want to turn off all the traces, just unload them, uh, and then they'll all go away. All right. Uh, let's, well, I'm going to save the watch list for a little bit later, uh, once we finish the aux button stack. How are we doing on time? Uh, I've got an hour and 15. Okay, good. All right. So this um, little reverse teardrop, this is the uh, favorite places panel, uh, list panel. This is the only list panel that will populate up on the right-hand side um, with the rest of the auxiliary uh, pop-ups. And you'll notice there are two by default. This is the favorite locations panel here on the bottom. There are two by default, CONUS, Continental United States, and Europe. Uh, let me make this... Um, larger so they're easier to read and i'm going to pull up the location chooser just so we can make some changes here and i'm going to unload um some of these others okay great <clears throat> so um let's dial in a new location let's say uh k or let's do miami again m i a m i i'm going to enter that make that a home location uh if you click on the plus sign in the favorite home locations header, that is the add button. So now, as you can see, it, it just added this last one that I have in the um, uh, selected as my home location. So let's do the same thing for, uh, let's do DCA, Washington DC airport. I'm going to click on plus and we'll do Los Angeles and plus. 
Okay, great. So now we've got a few new home locations set. Um, in each home location entry, you have the X, which is the you know remove delete button. Um, so let's just do that for uh, DC. And then the next one is uh, an edit. So you can actually uh, you know make an, a label change. Um, and let me just say like we can make this South Florida. Hit enter and that locks that in. Adds that in again. Um, so if you want to change the label, you can do that right here. Um, there are two ways to jump to that favorite location place. Uh, if you click on the word itself, it will rehome to that location. All right, and you'll notice that the um, the search radius box, you know, follows. That's how you, one another way to know that you're in a home location. So let me pop back over to Los Angeles. Boom. You'll notice that the camera pops, right? It just kind of goes black and then immediately re-renders at that new location. It doesn't zoom. If you want to move and sort of slide over, you don't change the home location. You just cam change the camera. Uh, you can use this button on the left. So you can see the difference. It slides over. Okay. Now, when you don't have a lot of data loaded, you may not you know, either one will serve its purpose. If you have a lot of um, trace data, uh, or if you're zoomed in and you're gonna require a bunch of map tiles to reload, you may wanna zoom, not pop. So again, the clicking on the target itself, it simply re, you know, slides over the data, uh, meaning the aircraft position and all that, it doesn't have to drop it and then recreate them. If you have a lot of traces on with large depths, then you might get a spinning wheel and it might take some time. Whereas if you just move them, it doesn't have to re-render, recalculate. It can be much faster. The only thing you may have to actually download are the map tiles in that case. <clears throat> so that's the different uh, the distinction between the um, you know clicking on the word itself, the label, and the icon uh, for the jump here, this uh, little target. <clears throat> okay, that clear? Okay, great. <clears throat> Any questions while I get some drinks? <clears throat> All right, excellent. Uh, so that is the favorite locations panel and the various functions of those. Uh, let me bring this back to Miami. Enter. All right, great. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to turn off the favorite locations uh, chooser there. I'm going to turn off the uh, target as well. And let's talk about this uh, next row. Uh, so this is um, sort of the uh, reset row, um, general functionality. Um, the first one, these two arrows in a square, that will reset the camera's orientation and position. <clears throat> so what I've done here is I've, I've kicked the camera up underneath the ground surface so I'm kind of in this weird position. Let me zoom out a whole bunch. <clears throat> if I want to reset the camera, I'm going to click on this button here. <clears throat> and you'll see that the, um, <clears throat> the camera has been repositioned back to sort of a normal angle, and the zoom has been reset, and I'm back to my home location. Okay. So let me do that again. I'll get myself all wonky. I'll zoom way out, uh, get myself sort of as far as off screen. So this is if you're like, I don't know what, how to get my camera back to something normal. Click on these two arrows in a square, and that's going to reset your camera position to something uh, more usable and familiar. All right. Uh, let me turn on auto refresh again. And just so we have something to work with, uh, the stop button, the stop sign, that will arrest any loading actions that you have. Um, if you happen to turn on all traces and it's, you know, and you've uh, set it for very long and you're sitting there waiting, your computer's slow and you're, you're waiting, 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 uh, you kind of want to get control back and, and change your settings so that you, something more, uh, uh, you know, you get a faster response time, you can click on that stop button. And basically that's going to stop any loading actions, stop any rendering that's happening and just kind of arrest Skyglass, so you get you know your mouse control back, okay. 
Um, if you, um, and then incidentally, if you have auto refresh on that kicks, that turns off auto refresh, okay? The burn button uh, is quite useful um, depending on the mode that you're in. If you click on the burn button, basically it's gonna stop all loading actions and also clear everything that's on the screen, all traces, all position data, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so uh, if I'm switching modes or if I'm switching home locations um, or doing something else, uh, you may wanna use that burn button. Uh, also, if something just doesn't seem right and you kinda of wanna you know, refresh everything, you can click on the burn and then start your auto refresh back or just click on the load button and kind of get everybody back to five by five. <clears throat> you will notice though, um, the loading action, when, the, when an aircraft first loads, that's what it takes the longest. It's very fast to refresh, but it does take some time depending on the number of aircraft to load. Um, okay, uh, last thing we'll do, let's talk about, um, well, let's talk about the jumper and then we'll do filters. All right. You'll notice that when we change home locations, if the jumper was on, that's this little icon here, this reverse teardrop with the target underneath it, um, that jumper moves around or rehomes re to that home location. If, I, if the jumper is on, like it is here with the green indicator, if I double click on the map, a couple things happen. That little jumper icon will, will move and my camera will move there as well. Um, you'll notice that the camera purple target is now co-located with that jumper. Let me do that again. I'll double click on the map and you'll see the jumper pops over there. Um, the jumper then tells me it does a quick reverse geocode lookup of the latitude and longitude and puts the and reads out there and then moves my camera to that position as well. Okay, it, um, uh, if I move, if I translate the camera by just clicking and dragging, you'll see now we have sort of, the, these are the three different icons that represent different position information in Skyglass. The jumper obviously has its big blue uh, target um, on, the, on the map face. Then we have the orange uh, target that represents the home, the current home location. And then we've got the center of rotation for the camera, uh, which is the purple. So if you, you'll notice if you hover over the jumper reverse teardrop, it turns green from blue. If you click on that, it becomes a button. If you click on it, you'll see all those um, three targets converged. So that tells you a few things. One, uh, the, the jumper itself didn't move. The camera has now moved to that area and your home location has now been repositioned to wherever that jumper was. All right, so let me, uh, let me zoom out with my camera. I'm gonna double click on Cuba and then I'm gonna move my mouse over to the uh, reverse or the, the big teardrop upside down, click on that. And now you'll see that my home location has now been repositioned over Cuba as well as my camera, et cetera. All right. Let me do the same thing. I'll double click on Jamaica. You can see our target is still over Cuba because it hasn't rehomed yet. I click on the uh, upside down teardrop, and now that's been rehomed. You'll also notice that the um, the left hand top uh, top left hand corner the um, in this case, unnamed road in Jamaica, that's been uh, updated there because uh, that's our, our target uh, where our jumper was. If you open up the location chooser, you'll notice that that also updates when you jump. So it kind of gives you a preview of like, well, that's where I, I will rehome if you either click on this target uh, or click on the jumper itself. Okay. All right. Um, I love the jumper. I think the jumper is fun to, you know, uh, especially if I want to move around quickly on the map, I just kind of, you know, double click off on, you know, to a certain area. And that kind of brings that camera to the, you know, to that area quickly. Um, 
So let's spend a little time in uh, Europe. Uh, if the jumper is on, meaning it's enabled in the auxiliary button stack, when you click on an aircraft, that moves the aircraft to the center of the camera. So let me demonstrate that here with this uh, B762. I'm clicking on it, and it zooms the camera over. If your jumper is off, then clicking on it will only, you know, populate the HUD and bring the um, trace on if it, the traces are enabled. It won't jump. You'll notice it's not jumping. If I turn that back on, then it's going to start jumping to that, making that that um, aircraft center stage, okay? You'll also notice though, this is important, when you jump, your center of rotation has now been elevated to that aircraft's flight level. So if I translate over a little bit, you'll see that my center of rotation, my camera pivot point here, this purple target is out in space, okay? You want to bring it back down. You can use keyboard controls, control drag, or double click on the map. And that brings that camera rotation down to the screen, uh, to the map level again. Does that make sense? All right. Five by five. Good stuff. Okay. Let's talk labels. So I'm going to turn off my location chooser. And um, by default, um, Part of this is on. Um, let me, uh, well, this is, good. this is a good time to do this. I'm gonna switch out of um, military mode and into standard mode. All right, now standard mode has one huge distinction in that the home location determines the search radius of what will load in standard mode, whereas in your mill mode, it loads worldwide traffic. Standard mode is location specific, home location specific. All right, so let's go, I'm gonna mouse over to uh, Spain. Let's go Madrid. I'm gonna double click on Madrid. I'm gonna click on the jumper and that changes my home location uh, to that area. And you'll notice that my I've got a big green box here. And this is the visual representation of your search radius, okay? And if you change your search radius uh, slider, you can see that that will update. Um, little uh, side note here, um, you know, maps, flat maps especially, are so skewed in that to make it flat, they've done a whole bunch of stuff to make it make it flat, right? Um, if you are towards the uh, equator, and I don't know where the equator is, I'm just giving a rough guess here, you'll see that that search radius, uh, this is actually you know 500 miles around, 250 miles out, et cetera, up and down. Um, but if you get in the North or Southern hemisphere and click and rehome, oh, let me rehome, you'll notice that that box gets, a little, it's not actually square, it's more rectangular. This is actually representing that distance in miles, right? So you can kind of get an idea of in, intrinsically of like the map correction that they've done, right? Because it's not just a square, not just a square. Uh, when you're zoomed, the map zoomed in, that um, distortion sort of goes away. But that's why you're going to get this sort of, um, you know, square box, certain areas, wide box, tall boxes in different different places. Okay, so uh, let me get back on Madrid and uh, rehome. All right, um, so I bring this up because Skyglass will max out depending on your computer hardware. Um, it's highly dependent on the, the amount of RAM and the, the processor you have. Uh, anything over, you know, anytime about, you know, for my machine specifically, anything over about 500 or 600 different aircraft that are loaded will start to really slow down the rendering of each new aircraft and it will get to a crawl. Uh, very few computers can load all traffic worldwide. Okay, just in the 3D space, it's, um, you know, uh, orders of magnitude more complex than a um, 2D map. So uh, if you are wanting to load all types of aircraft, um, keep your search radius low. 
Okay, really want everybody to hear this because if you don't, it'll it'll just uh, make Skyglass really crawl and your uh, user experience will be quite poor. So what are the different classes? Uh, military is sort of the obvious class. Um, if you look at the filter uh, pop up here, this top row has the four different classes of aircraft. And they're really just three. And then there's the emergency class, which any aircraft can become an emergency. So it's a little bit of a difference. So blue aircraft, uh, what I refer to as the normies, that's basically anything that's not masked or military. Okay, commercial aircraft, private aircraft, um, anything that is not in the masked program and not um, part of the military, uh, any fleet, that's going to be a normal aircraft or, or normie. Um, so let me, uh, I'm going to change the map zoom and uh, load a snapshot so we can see all the different aircraft in that search radius. Well, that doesn't make, there's not a whole lot there. All right, let's move, um, let's go to LAX. I know there's going to be lots of aircraft over there. Oh, it's probably night. That makes sense. Okay. It's night in Europe. Okay. All right, so let me, I'm going to reload aircraft. There we go. All right, we got some good counts here, and we're loading up a whole bunch. All right. Okay, so let me bring my vertical sliders back. And you'll notice we've got a bunch of stuff that's off screen. So, uh, and we've also zoomed in. So I'm going to change the scale a little bit, and I'm going to click towards the middle or click lower so we can see. There we go. So this is kind of like, once I know I've, I can see the sort of top levels, that's at least for me, this is how I kind of check stuff out. Um, if you're only interested in the ground stuff, you can keep that high. Um, all right, now let me make this uh, scale a little bit larger and I'm going to bump our map zoom in one more. All right, good. So now we can kind of get a good, a good view here of the LA area. So you'll notice we've got three different colors that mimic this class um, classification. We've got a lot of blues, a lot of normies. Uh, we've got a couple of military. Let me turn off the sliders. Uh, we've got a couple of military, and then we've got a bunch of these uh, magenta birds. Uh, the magentas are the masked aircraft. So when I say masked aircraft, there are two programs in the FAA. Um, they're both sort of pay to play. Um, there's one that's quite popular, 99 in you know, percent of the aircraft are in this second category. LAD uh, is the program. Uh, limited aircraft data display is what that means, but that's when you see the acronym in, in SkyGlass in the database, for example, it's a LAD. Um, there is one other program called PIA, uh, Privatized Aircraft Information or something like that. Um, that's a very rare type. It's for, um, it's when the FAA actually uh, assigns like a block of hex codes that a, a like a manufacturer of transponders can use and roll over while in flight for testing. Um, it's very rare. Uh, most of these aircraft uh, that want to be in the sort of private category and not in the public view, they're in the LAD category, their LAD distinction. Uh, so if you click on any of these buttons here, you can toggle on or off that classification. So if we want to just look at the mask flights, for example, I can turn off the normies turn off military. All right. Now, when you've done that, specifically, if you turn off the normies, now you've reduced the number of, of aircraft that are going to be loaded and displayed. So now you can actually bump your search radius up quite far and do find within SkyGlass. So let me uh, zoom the map out a few levels. Uh, I'm going to use my jumper to get sort of more center. Uh, and bump this out even more. So now I'm at 600 miles and I'm gonna load a snapshot. And since I only have the masked traffic loaded, boom, we've got, and it's nice and it's nice and snappy. And again, you'll need to bring your uh, sliders up, maybe make an adjustment because we've moved, uh, moved out. But now you can get, you know, if you're working with, mil with masked or just military or either of the two, um, and you wanna be geographically, uh, you know, um, set here. That's how you do that. Ah, this is good. So um, let me bump this out a little bit more. You'll notice we've got this fourth color here, this green. Do you see that on the screen? We've got a couple of aircraft here. The 
magenta or green are the masked aircraft. So this is actually this FM-11. Um, let's see if that's, yeah, this FM-11, these are in the PIA masked category. Uh, let me turn off the military. Yeah, so that's the distinction. But as you can see, very, very, very few. I'm just kind of surprised we actually caught one um, or two, in fact. But that's probably on a field um, and being utilized by a transponder, you know, uh, manufacturer or uh, mechanic shop doing something like that. Anyway, um, occasionally you do see them flying as well, but that's the green profile icon. Uh, everybody else is purple when they're masked. Um, so incidentally, if you, uh, this is how you can get military over just a specific area. Go into standard mode, disable these other aircraft classes, meaning normies and masked, and now you've got a regional military view. All right, and this is when you can really uh, turn the auto refresh on and get it at one second, and let it let it run, and you know keep a nice real you know snappy view. Even even have the United States. Uh, you can even do this over Conus. Um, let's do that, and I'm going to keep auto refresh on. Just so you can see how fast this is going to go. Uh, I've got my favorite locations panel up. I'm going to rehome to Conus. I'm going to zoom out. And bump my slider up. Okay, I probably zoomed out a little bit too much. Let me zoom in a little bit more. One more. There we go. Conus. And there we are. I'm going to reset my uh, map because I got a little few map tiles that were wonky. Great. So now, I'm in a uh, auto re refresh state, but only pulling the CONUS um, military. You'll see there's nothing over um, Europe, et cetera. Okay, good. All right, you'll notice we have this emergency that just popped up. Because the emergency class is um, enabled, uh, if there is an, an aircraft that is reported um, as an emergency, uh, it will do a couple of different things. One, we're gonna get this emergency panel, which has popped up. Uh, if you click on the um, click on the entry itself, should load. Uh, maybe it's not, okay, let me turn off auto refresh so we get a little bit snappier uh, performance here. Okay, so you'll notice um, We've got the aircraft identifier, the tail number, what the transponder, I'm sorry, what the emergency code that was being pulled from the system um, downed. I actually haven't been able to get a good, um, you know, explanation from this, from, you know, uh, apart from it, it may actually be a downed aircraft. Um, sounds kind of scary, but, you know, that may, may have happened. Looks like it's a, um, uh, this Hawker. Is it NA? Uh, let's turn on the um, class or the uh, other information here. All right. Now, now that we're in standard mode, we're getting some of that other information from the tower um, broadcast. We've got a light category. Uh, ADSB ACIO is the source type of the transponder it's squawking at. Um, anyway, you'll see that the. Um, no, that's not correct. No. Where is this guy? He must be off screen now. All right. When we do have an emergency aircraft, uh, let me turn that off again. If I click on the, um, if I click on, so yeah, it's not, it's not squawking anymore. Okay. Um, the icon itself, the octagon will flash yellow and will have a red border around it. Uh, I sort of misinterpreted this, um, this hawk, uh, this is the watch list uh, identifier. If something on, is on your watch list, it has this sort of purple uh, background. Okay. Any aircraft can become an emergency, a normie or a military or masked. Um, and it will always have the same profile uh, icon color, but the background of the octagon and the, and the frame will change. Okay. Um, all right, so we talked about how to get into sort of a geographic specific military mode. Um, we've talked about 
the uh, search radius and how to adjust that. Um, again, if you're going to have normies on, you definitely want to keep your search radius down to something manageable. Um, otherwise, you're going to get uh, some pretty uh, difficult, you know, Skyglass is going to crawl because there's just so many aircraft. All right. This is probably a good time to talk about um, the sweeper. Uh, this little broom icon here um, represents uh, the sweeper functionality. And so let me turn, I'm going to load aircraft again. And you'll notice that um, all those aircraft that were outside of my search radius went away because they're old and my sweeper is on. All right, so let me uh, demonstrate that by, uh, I'm going to turn on the auto refresh. I'm going to make this five seconds. And I'm going to turn the search radius up. And again, we're only in military. Uh, okay, so as I decrease this search radius, and I'm just doing this as an example, as you can see how the sweeper works. If, this, if an aircraft has not been updated, its position has not been updated in the last three auto refresh cycles, right? It's going to be swept off of the screen, meaning it's it's too old to be considered reliable. So it goes away. So I'm going to reduce my search radius and you'll see um, after a few seconds, they'll, they'll linger, but after a few seconds, they're going to get pulled off the screen. And then you'll see that this um, negative number in the top right-hand corner of the HUD, that's going to update as well. There we go. 47 were just removed based on that that uh, difference. Okay, so let me get this down even further. And um, let me get over somewhere populous like Dallas. I'm gonna click and we'll see that update again. You'll we'll see some of them are starting to, to be timed out and then eventually they all will. Okay, so the sweeper, again, removes aircraft that are sort of in that stale category, meaning they have not been updated in at least three auto refresh cycles. If your auto refresh is up at one minute, that means if they're three minutes old. In this case, we're at five seconds, so it means anything over the, older than 15 seconds. So it, it's a variable based on your auto refresh um, slider depth here. Okay. So uh, why would you turn the, the sweeper off? Um, there is an edge case. If you are looking at a specific um, airport and you were like, I'm going to leave my sky glass on for several hours and I want to see every aircraft that has come through in, those, in, those, in that time period, you can turn the sweeper off and then the last known position of that aircraft, it'll just sort of hang out in space. So that would be an example of how you could work that to use as an example, or you know, in a sort of edge case. Um, most times you're going to want to keep that sweeper on to keep your display of sky glass current and um, you know meaningful. All right. Okay, so let me do this. I'm going to turn on the normies and the masked, and I'm going to zoom in again and bring that slider down. So we're looking at all the aircraft, and let me just tell you about the last pieces of this filter. Um, all right, my jumper's on, so let me jump on an aircraft. There we go. All right. So um, as you've seen, when you hover over an aircraft, we've got these pop-up panels. Um, you can turn those on for all aircraft that are on, on display. And that's with these uh, this lower section here. Uh, let me clean up the UI just so it's easier to focus. There we go. Uh, incidentally, the top right hand corner, uh, there's this little box within a box with an arrow. Clicking on that will disable the aircraft dis HUD display. So then when you hover, you're only going to get the pop-ups, not the stuff in the right hand corner. Turning that back on hover again, then you'll get there, the aircraft uh, data in the HUD, okay? For this purpose, I'm just gonna turn it off so we can keep the UI nice and clean. Okay, so back to the filter um, display here, and you'll notice this uh, filter icon in the auxiliary button stack top middle. This is where you can turn the, you know, bring those um, options, uh, turn them on and off. 
All right. And so you'll notice that the, the icon itself is on by default. You can turn those off. And now we just have the chevrons, which are the positions of the different aircraft. All right. Let me turn those back on. And you can do, uh, they're broken up into, into three or four different categories. Um, first, you've got the type and the transponder code. You can turn that on for all aircraft. Then there is the call sign and the registration hex code, that lower right-hand side. And then there's the telemetry. And you can do any or all. So like now I'm just in a sort of telemetry mode. Um, I personally, uh, when I'm looking at military aircraft, I like to look at the um, just the types, just so I can kind of scan because I'm not as um, you know proficient with identifying the different icons and identifying them with the type as you know uh, an Air Force veteran would be or monkey would be. So um, I like to turn on the uh, the types and then look at them that way. And then you can bump up the size and again the panels as well. Those update. Uh, or to scale with the different sizes. Okay. Um, and then if you have the database loaded, let me do that now. Uh, click on the database icon, and uh, it's going to say, oh, gonna, it's going to take a minute to load. Say, okay. We'll get this little larger loading slider to let you know that something else is happening. And let me turn off the normies and the military. And oh, check this out. So now with this, uh, with the database loaded and the database icon here, now you can see there's an extra uh, display panel of the owner operator. So if you find an interesting trace, you can do a little digging, find the owner operator. Um, if you guys remember Brio 68 that used to do the spy patterns over. Um, uh, the uh, over you know the Ukraine border etc. This is how I dis this is how I discovered that this was Lasai and that they have a fleet. So I went found the owner operator, went into the database, searched on that owner operator, found all the other aircraft in their fleet, and then started tracking those aircraft. And we discovered oh there's Brio sixty six and there's a few other aircraft that are doing routes and um, surveys in different areas. Uh, so this is how you're going to get the um, one way to sort of troll for that database information. All right, uh, military doesn't have an owner operator. So what I did is I just sort of decoded the country and I display that in the in the area. So let's do, um, let's pop it up so you can kind of see that in action. I'll zoom out a little bit. Bring my search radius up. We've got normies off. There we go. So now you can see we get German, uh, Czech Republic, Slovenia, Poland, etc. All right. That's a reverse lookup actually by the hex code. That's how I determine the country. By the way, those are uh, the hex codes are country coded uh, when they're um, issued for that transponder. Okay. So we're coming up on the last few minutes. I do have the um, watch list still to cover. Uh, any questions? Oh, all right. Let me cover real quickly the search function. Um, all right. So let me load an aircraft. Let's get this um, turn on the HUD. I'm going to pop this information so we have somebody to grab. I'm going to grab the call sign on the clipboard now. I'm going to burn. So I've cleared the screen and I'm going to turn on the search, which is this magnifying glass. Uh, let me clean up the UI. Okay, so now I've got the search box. And since I put that call sign on the clipboard, I'm just going to paste it. And then you can search on uh, four different things. You can search on the hex code, search on the call sign, search on the registration or tail number, or by the squat code. Uh, which can be kind of interesting, and it's kind of an edge case. I'll talk about it. In this case, we've got the call sign, so I'm going to click on the call sign button. And, oh, it failed. All right, so let's load. Let's get a different example. Uh, let's grab this GAF 607. Put that on my clipboard. I'm going to paste. 
and clear just so we can see how it works and call sign. Boom. So if it's found, it's going to move the, the camera over to that location. And uh, then it gave you a little um, success indicator that is just temporary on the screen. Okay. Um, one thing I thought was fascinating as a sort of base, uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you're a pilot or familiar with aviation, you know that if you're not in controlled airspace, you can have the, the, the standard squat code is 1200. So I can put in 1200 and uh, let me pop over to CONUS. And I can search on call uh, transponder 1200 and that will actually load up all aircraft that are flying uncontrolled. Let me turn off the uh, database labels so we don't get to see those. And you'll see there's uh, about 2000 aircraft that are flying um, as uncontrolled. So that's kind of an interesting thing. You can actually go and pull the all, all aircraft that are flying 1200. All right, so that's gonna take a while. I'm gonna go ahead and hit the stop button. So that's gonna rest that loading action, clear the screen. All right. Okay, I've covered a whole bunch. Any questions? Uh, Neil said he tried, no success. Oh, okay, that was for the, um, must have been the video. All right, no problem. Well, you can see how late I am with the, I <laughs> keep it up with chat. <laughs> My apologies. All right, so I'm going to turn off the uh, search button. And last thing we're going to talk about is the watch list. Uh, TS, TGS, did you have a question? I saw something flash on your screen. I wasn't sure if that was you or something else. Okay. Uh, welcome, Gil. I didn't see you pop in. Okay, great. All right, uh, and what I'm gonna, let me preload here. Uh, so let me, uh, I'm gonna load some traffic. Uh, let me get my search radius down to something tight. 50 miles, that's way tight enough. I'm gonna burn and load a snapshot. And I'm gonna turn on the normies so we get a little bit more traffic. Let me zoom my map in so we can see what we're doing. Let me get to uh, 100 miles. That's good. Reload. All right. So now we got a fair amount of stuff here. Okay. So anytime that you see aircraft uh, in the field like this, if you right click while you're hovering, that's going to automatically uh, put them on the watch list. All right. So I'm just going to go around here real quickly and add a bunch to the watch list. You'll see my watch list panel, which I've opened up, is starting to populate with um, in this sort of unassigned group. All right, and you'll notice that my icons, um, the color of the profile is the same, but the background and the border now reflect that it's on the watch list, a little different color. So this is how you can quickly see in the field what's on your watch list and what's not. Okay, so now that we've got some aircraft loaded up on the watch list, let me, um, let's do some watch list stuff. So just some basics. Okay, in the watch list header, there are two rows. Uh, by default, both of them are on. This top header is sort of this auxiliary watch list header that's governed by the far right icon. Okay. Um, so if you, and this has a bunch of different features. Um, I'm not going to go into all of them now, uh, but I do want to cover uh, this one here. Um, the sort of two windows overlapping each other. This will automatically group all of the different aircraft that are in your watch list that are not in a group, okay? So that only the ones that are in the unassigned group, it's gonna throw them into their own groups based on the type. 
So you can, I'll do that now as you can see what happens. So we're, we've got an unassigned group right now and all the aircraft are in there. I'll click on this button. And now we have a bunch of different groups. And they're all by the type. Uh, let me clean up my UI. There we go. Okay, so now we've got a bunch of different groups here. Um, one aircraft, you know, per at this uh, for this one, this would make more sense if you got like a bunch of text twos or a bunch of K thirty five Rs, etc. Then they'll then they'll you know be uh, more in the group. But this is how you can quickly make different groups based by type. So let's work with these different groups. Uh, so let me take the text two. If you look in the group header. Um, there's an edit button there. If I click on that, I can change the name of that group. Click enter or click on that save button. And now you can see I've changed the, the, that to a, um, that group name to trainer. So now let's say, well, I want to move this T-38 into this group. You can do that a couple different ways. You can go to the aircraft entry itself, click on the edit. That's going to bring up this pop-up window and say, oh, I want to change it to a different group, right? Um, I'm not going to do that now. I'll just let that go and close the window. Or if you grab the icon itself and drag it, oops, wrong one. All right. If you, uh, all right, so let's do that again. Let's take this ULAC. Let's make this, uh, this is the test group. Hit enter. I'm going to grab this T38, drag it into this group. Uh, of test, and you'll notice that that T-38 group went away because there's now there's no longer any aircraft in that group. Uh, now they're, you know, now we've got them in the test. So I'll do the same thing with this P-32R, drag and drop, drag and drop. Take this one, C-72, drag and drop. Okay, and after every time I do something, you'll notice that the uh, aircraft list was going to change or update. So now I'm just kind of ganging up some of these different aircraft into different groups. There we go. Okay, cool. And I'll pull this uh, NA over to the H60s. All right, cool. So now we have just a couple of groups. All right. In the same way that your type list panel, you could isolate and hide. You can do that with these groups. Right click. Turns it blue, isolate, left click, I'm sorry, right click, turn it red, that hides that group. Just clicking it again brings it back. And again, notice that when we're in this mode, it's gonna hide everything, not just the stuff that's from the watch list, right? So if I just isolate to test, I only see that watch list group. Okay, all right. Um, now, each watch list entry, uh, we're coming right up on time, so I'll, I'll move through this quickly. Each aircraft entry has uh, three different fields. The first one, depending on how you added it to the watch list, will inherit different things. Sometimes it's a call sign. If you're right-clicking on it, it's going to use the hex code, but that's an editable label, all right? So this, like, this text 2 hex code is this. So the first one is the label. The second one is the current call sign. And then the last one is the aircraft type. So the call sign will get updated every time it flies again. It's changed its call sign. That's going to update. Uh, but I can change this um, uh, hex code to a label and say, this is my trainee. Hit save. Now you can see that that aircraft, I've now given it a custom label. All right. Clicking on this entry, will move that to center screen. If you want to delete an entry, you, you've got the banner icon here, click on the delete. And what it, there's sort of a two-step delete. It's not going to just delete it outright. It's going to move it into a deleted group. And then if you really want to delete it, you know, you're sure you didn't do that by accident and hit it, didn't uh, fat finger it, uh, then you can click on it and it will actually get removed from the watch list. Okay, so there's a two-step process in that. Uh, that way, if it's still on screen, you can just right-click, add it back in. Um, the banner icon is the sort of uh, sky glass centric way to, um, you know, uh, manage watch list stuff. So uh, to remove it from the watch list, you can also do that from the HUD. 
by clicking on, but right now the text, this aircraft is on the watch list because you can see the green banner is lit. If I turn that off, it's immediately removed from the watch list. If I can put it right back on by clicking on the banner in the HUD. Okay, uh, you can also do some group level stuff by, uh, you know, traces, turn on the traces for all the different uh, aircraft, uh, run flight histories. Uh, you can delete that aircraft or the whole group by clicking on the burn button, uh, et cetera. Um, I, I'll, I'll do the, well, two two more quick things. Um, the In the watch list header, uh, you have the count of how many aircraft that you've got and how many are flying. Uh, you've got an auto refresh for just the watch list. So you don't have to have the watch list or the auto refresh on. For all aircraft, you can just turn on for the watch list and just have your watch list going, uh, which can be nice. You get this little countdown or uh, clock here. Um, what I want to show you, though, is two things. There, the map um, reverse teardrop, you click on that, then the aircraft display changes. You still have the label, but then you have the last known location. And that will update every time they get updated. So this is uh, quickly, you can kind of scan and go, oh, it's over in Oklahoma, Oklahoma, Texas, you know, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Clicking on it again brings it back into the sort of standard watch list mode. So you've got two modes in watch list, standard and then sort of location display. Um, you can turn on traces for everything in your watch list with that button. Um, this one is also quite important. If you click on this and it turns green, then only aircraft that are airborne will show up in the list. Um, if you go in the database and you add all the C-17s, for example, you know many of them won't be flying and you don't wanna see uh, you know, aircraft that are not live. So this is how you can limit what's listed here as just live aircraft um, with that, you know, turning this toggle on. Uh, each group can also be collapsed or expanded using the little chevrons, or you can do them all by clicking on uh, the one in the header. I like to do it this way. Um, you'll also notice, um, well, let me let me work an example just so you can see it. Uh, I'm gonna open up the database. I'm gonna make my, and then I'm gonna search on uh, K35Rs type, limit returns to just 10 search. And I'm gonna do K35Rs. Uh, add to list. Perfect. Closing the database. Okay. So you'll know what I wanted to do was just add some aircraft into the list, which probably we're not going to be flying. So we'll get a group that has no active aircraft. And you'll notice that the color is different. Um, we expand. And then I turn off the show only active. Now you can see, now you can see the full color difference. If it, the aircraft that is not active is going to be gray and the group itself will be this sort of muted orange and not this bright orange, meaning it doesn't have any active aircraft. So now we'll collapse them all. And you can see, so this is how when you have groups and your watch list buffed out, you can see kind of what group has nothing, you know, won't have any, um, the, the aircraft that have aircraft flying will be called, uh, you know, highlighted because it's got a brighter color. Uh, and then you can see the count of how many are air, you know, airborne uh, of total of that group count. Okay. Covered a lot in the last <laughs> two minutes. I'll leave it there, uh, but I'm all open for questions. We can say as long as we want for questions. Any feedback, any questions? Awesome. I just want to say that this has been awesome. Um, you know, the more we, I'm new to this, so the more we get into it, um, you know, and it's great you got the, uh, all of the videos and everything uh, that you can access as well. So you've got a great system here. I just have to say thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for the feedback. Um, thank you. You know, I, uh, it, it's been a long journey in building Skyglass, obviously. Uh, once I connected with Monkey and really started to see, you know, what the purposes of, of his, what he was doing and what his community was doing, I really started to get a lot of good feedback. The 
different features really started to expand, uh, which is cool. I mean, you can do stuff in Skyglass that you literally cannot do anywhere else, at least that I've seen with, you know, readily available off the shelf flight trackers. And again, nothing in 3D, but man, it really adds to the, to the learning curve. And so um, some, one, of my, one of my power users was kind of telling me, yeah, it's about eight to 10 hours of full instruction to like cover everything. So with these deep dives, um, we're doing that. Uh, just to highlight for those that may be watching this as a recording, um, you know, all these live sessions are recorded. I've also done a few um, deep, you know, intros and some, some deep dive stuff. And I've also done single, uh, what I call quick hops. If you go to the tutorial section, there'll be uh, just a quick five, six minute tutorial on just a specific feature. So you can kind of, you know, take things at your own pace there. Um, definitely recommend that. Um, and definitely recommend these deep dives as we go into, um, uh, you know, specifically the database and the time travel mode and flight history, stuff like that too. Um, anyway, cool. Uh, so appreciate your feedback. Really appreciate everybody being here. Any other questions before I, before we leave? And I, if you want to leave some comments or some feedback in the, um, in the meeting chat, that would be great. Uh, definitely uh, read them all. And, um, uh, you know, that all that feedback is always useful. Oh, and lastly, well, a couple things. Um, if you want to support Skyglass in a deeper way, you can see I've got a bunch of different merch in the store. We sell feeders. I sell clothing. You can see we've got the t-shirts and the mugs and all that kind of stuff. Um, you can also join uh, the Skyglass Patreon channel. Uh, if you want to add, you know, more than just your subscription, uh, I am a one man uh, band, an army of one here. I wear all the hats. I do everything from coding to website to everything. It's just me, all the, the tech support as well. Uh, so if you want to, you know, help me um, keep the lights on and keep, you know, developing and focused on this uh, in a greater way, join the Patreon channel. Patreon members always have, um, you know, sort of reserve seating for these live tutorials. Um, so you can always join in. And um, uh, what was the last thing I was going to mention that? Uh, oh, if you ever find yourself saying, I wish I could do X with Skyglass, please tell me. Please reach out via the support form or the need help chat button uh, or in any of these kind of, just find your way to me because I tell you, um, I really listen to the users and I'm always expanding. And most of it is based on user feedback. Okay, so for example, um, there's you know sharing watch list is a, is a perfect way. That's going to be in a in a the ability to do that. Post your watch list on um, uh, on Skyglass for other people to see. Um, you know, uh, exporting and importing that was all a user suggestion, uh, and um, we're going to do some chat. There's a bunch of other features that are coming up. Weather. I'm also working on a weather layer, so you can see that. Uh, anyway, I really drive the development based on user feedback. So if you have an idea, please reach out. All right, cool. Uh, unless we have anything else, any other questions to cover, I will leave it there. Uh, hopefully we will see you back on Friday for the deep dives. And um, thanks for being here. Thank you so Bye. much and have a great day. You bet. Thank you, Greg. Take care, everybody. Skyglass out.